वेलकम एवरी वन दिस इज इंडियन एक्सप्रेस ऑफ ट्वेल्थ सेप्टेम्बर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू एंड आई विल एक्सप्लेन दिस न्यूज़ पेपर इन थ्री स्टेप्स फर्स्ट इज वाई इज द न्यूज सेकेंड इज वॉट इज द न्यूज एंड थर्ड इज वॉट कैन बी द फ्यूचर प्रॉस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ द न्यूज सो वी सी अ पिक पिक्चर हेयर इट क्लियरली शोज द टैंक्स एंड यू एस यूक्रेन पुशेज ऑन एज रशिया लीव्स खारकीव so you know ukraine is trying to hold on to where it is and push the russia back to its own land so that is why ukraine is uh, ukraine soldiers transport a russian tank that was captured during the counter offensive in kharkiv ukrainian forces kept pushing north in the kharkiv region Ukraine army chief said on Sunday a day after their rapid gains made Russia abandon its main bastion in the area President Vladimir Zelensky he hailed Ukraine's advance as a major breakthrough in the war so what exactly this means it means that Ukraine has pushed Russia back it has taken its land back which was captured captured by Russia we see our next headline uh, so this news is important India Saudi ties promise shared growth security stability says jay shankar so why is this news this news is because our external affairs minister mr s jay shankar has visited saudi in order to make ties good and why i'm talking that in order to make ties good because ties have gone to a low why exactly nupu sharma who was bjp spokesperson who was a spokesperson she called on some bad remarks about prophet muhammad so all of the gulf countries including saudi arabia pushed india and talked about having bad relations with them so in order to reset these relationship s jashankar has visited saudi arabia so what exactly are the outcomes says india will be fastest growing economy this year with 7% growth so this is by saudi arabian estimates emphasizes the importance of strategic economic ties that are between india and south saudi arabia our minister have said that this collaboration holds the promise of shared growth prosperity stability security and development so he reached riyadh uh, riyadh on saturday which is the saudi arabia capital he is on a three day visit to saudi arabia he it is his first visit as an external affairs minister he also addressed the diplomats at some institute in riyadh and he underlined the importance of india saudi strategic relationship at a time when the world is at crossroads so for exactly that means what is at crossroads means world is at war europe is in war china and taiwan not exactly in war but are in conflict so he is talking that this is very important in this time our collaboration holds promise of shared growth prosperity stability security development also he tweeted back at an interaction with the indian community so it was pre decided that he will interact with the expats living in saudi arabia so he is also interacted there with the indian community and he hailed the ties between the two countries and he said that saudi was very helpful so this country was very helpful when exactly during the covid-19 pandemic so why exactly india needs to reset india needs the gulf country saudi arabia in particular why in order to invest in the country and powered its economic recovery the relations were at a very significantly low position and why after the diplomatic backlash on the remarks on the prophet earlier this year the government is proactively seeking to deepen the ties so this is why what i told you so this is a reason why s shankar has visited saudi arabia now here it is given we saw our international friendships also deliver at that time at that point of time which is covid 
so he's talking about covid saudi arabia was very helpful and it provided supplies of oxygen so you may remember that in india there was lack of oxygen many people died because of lack of such, such oxygen cylinders two years of covid are when the country was tested but we came through he also talked about current geopolitical situation he said world is facing many challenges first rising food second oil and shipping prices why due to ukraine crisis but he said that we are but we are he said that we are still very confident that india will be the fastest growing major economy in the world this year and we will get at least 7% growth he said that india's economic recovery after covid was worth studying stating that many countries spent a lot of money during the covid period he said this is true you may be surprised to know that japan spent 50% of its gdp in the covid period and india 3% what about us more than 1 trillion dollars so india started with a lot of you can say caution it relieved its people in two times it was a two time plan which was done in covid period and he said that i would say like a knee jerk they were a hurry to respond to the crisis situation so this is exactly what japan has done there was a hurry you cannot spend 50% of your gdp on a crisis so miscalculations occurred in other countries but not in india obviously people need that money people need that support but it should be calculated so they did not necessarily use their funds and resources wisely this is what exactly he wants to say that their funds and resources were not used very wisely during his visit jay shankar co-chaired with his saudi arabian counterpart his name is prince fazal bin farhan al saud he is a first ministerial meeting in the pssc and what exactly that means it's a committee on political security social and cultural cooperation which is established under the framework of india saudi arabia strategic partnership council he tweeted that warm and productive meeting with saudi foreign ministers hh prince whose name is fazal bin farhan this afternoon it was co-chaired and he co-chaired the political security social and cultural committee of the india saudi partnership council what exactly were the discussions discussions were about current global political and economic concerns an agreement to work closely together in the g20 and also in the multilateral organizations so discussions were current global political and economic concerns obviously china taiwan ukraine russia europe in the war agreed to work closely in g20 and multilateral organizations so saudi arabia is the india's fourth largest trading partner 18% of india's crude oil imports come from saudi arabia what exactly are the numbers fiscal year 2022 bilateral tri, uh, trade 29 billion dollar at that period india's import from saudi arabia were 22.65 billion dollars and exports 6.63 billion so obviously imports are more and you uh, we'll see that imports are less how many expats live there in saudi arabia 2.2 million strong indian community is the largest expatriate community in saudi arabia according to indian embassy riyadh which is the capital of saudi arabia jay shankar also met with gcc secretary general its gulf cooperation council he also met there and who is the secretary general naif falah mubarak al hazraf two leaders also signed a memorandum of understanding so this is important the two leaders signed a memorandum of understanding on the mechanism of consultations between india and six national regional bloc what he tweeted after the meeting what jay shankar tweeted he tweeted exactly exchanged views on current regional and global situations and the relevance of india gcc cooperation in that context what is gcc gcc is a regional intergovernmental political 
economic union that comprises countries like Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, UAE. So this is what uh, GCC is. So we see no talks about Prophet Muhammad and we have expected that there will be serious backlashes from Saudi Arabia but there were no talks regarding that. So it means that Saudi Arabia, this country, now does not consider India as a guilty. It considers the person Nupur Sharma as a guilty. So we see that and uh, as yesterday I have promised that I will provide you some extra efforts and extra notes of the newspaper. So I will write it down that why exactly India needs Saudi Arabia. What are the key elements between India and Saudi Arabia relations? And why exactly Saudi Arabia needs India? So this will be written and you can check it out in the Telegram channel. Link is given in the description. Now first page have uh, this You see political news. Next come the news, new paradigm, FTAs, multilateral exposures, limited to supply chains and governance. So what is FTA? Free trade agreement. And why this is the news? This is the news because India has uh, come forward to take a new approach in terms of the partnership that it make in the global arena. So what exactly is the India's decision? So India is decided, India has decided, India's decision to stay away from the trade pillar of the US-led Indo-Pacific economic framework. So you know that US has started this Indo-Pacific economic framework ties. Ties in and evolving consensus is New Delhi's approach to global partnership. What this new consensus defines, that this new consensus has some deepening guide, grid lines. First, is staying off multilateral trade packs. So India wants to stay away from these such kind of multilateral pacts of trade. Second is sticking to bilateral deals that progressively built on an early harvest scheme. It wants to stick to person to person, one country to one country. Such deals are the main priority of India, actively integrating into specialized global supply chains. India wants to be a part of such a global supply chains. It sees China, Taiwan, Bangladesh as a part of global supply chain. It wants to become that part too. And what exactly are the areas that it wants to become a global supply chains? First is the rare earth what you can call pharmaceutical ingredients and also restricting multilateral exposure to focused agreement. It do not want more countries to come forward. Restrict, it wants to restrict multilateral exposure to such focused agreements. For example, tackling black money or cryptocurrency rules. So this is exactly what India has decided to do. The, back, uh, the backtracking on multilateral engagement on commerce comes at a time when trade statistics are beginning to turn in payment after a short point phase. We see exactly that India is not that good in trade now a time. The adverse contribution of net exports, so adverse means poor, harmful, harmful contribution of net exports and this is not a positive 6.2 it's a minus 6.2 it has reduced the real GDP growth the minus 6.2 will obviously reduce the GDP growth even as the country's trade deficit narrowed slightly to 28.7 billion in August from a record of 30 billion. So India's trade deficit have come down 
but exports also have come down. But the global slowdown is a key contributing factor. You see global slowdown and what exactly that means from global slowdown. The economies of major countries are not growing at a pace that they are expected. UK is in recession. US is not going that much. China has a negative growth. So in that uh, dim light, India comes as a bright spot. India seems to be impacted more than others as the trade pie shrinks. For instance, in the key US market for textile and garment, India's growth in the first six months, which was nearly 30%, it is the slowest among the top five exporters, excluding China. So all the countries export that export textiles and garments to US. If you exclude China, India is India has the lowest growth. Other suppliers such as Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia all are doing way better with India marginally trailing the average growth that all supplies of textiles and garments into the US clocked. So this exactly means that India is way behind other countries such as Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia in terms of its supply of textiles and garments. US or government officials rightly made a distinction between IPEF, this is Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and other multilateral deals that India walked out of previously. So there is a distinction between IPEF and other multilateral trades. IPF is not exactly a trade pact. It is also a provision of multiple pillars that does not does entail an option to participants to choose what they want to be part of. So there is a considerable, you can say, freedom in this IPF. They can choose what they want to be part of. Countries can choose that. It's not a take it or leave it arrangement like other deals are. IPEF was launched at a Quad Summit in Tokyo and it was it is seen as a Joe Biden's administration pivot to somewhat compensate for Washington exclusion from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this Trans-Pacific Partnership Washington was not made apart. So it wants to make another pact which is Indo-Pacific Economic Framework which will prove, this framework will prove as a vehicle to re-establish American economic heft in the Indo-Pacific. It wants to become that hegemon in Indo-Pacific too. As you know, Indo-Pacific is a nascent or you can call new bond area. It's not a new bond, but it has uh, become a priority for most of the countries. And since the IPF is not a regular trade pact, the 14 members are so far not obligated by all four pillars despite being signatory. So there are four pillars of IPEF and I will explain that. I will write it down, the four pillars in page and I will post that to Telegram channel. You can watch it. What are exactly the four pillars? You, uh, the countries do not have to follow all the four pillars besides being signatory to that. So while state is staying off the trade pact, trade part of arrangement, India has joined the other three pillars of the multilateral arrangement, supply chains, tax and anti-corruption and clean energy. So it has joined all these. Also the IPEF envisages some degree of synergies with quad members strategic priorities. The IPF does not incorporate issues. It does not take it issues. What issues? Tariff reduction or you can call reciprocal commitments. It does not take such issues. So India's participation in this agreement in IPEF, it was ensured by giving it flexibility, giving it freedom in terms of which pillar it wants to join. So IPEF, you can call it a freedom. You want to join one pillar, two pillar, three pillar, you can join. You are not bounded to join all four pillars. So the onboarding of India's concern and flexibility on the IPEF after New Delhi 
which was on the eve of the conclusion of pan asian regional comprehensive economic partnership it announced india's withdrawal from the agreement and why because of the concerns in the surge of imports from china so it was uh, so india withdrawal from rcef ep the ipef which is indo pacific economic framework this engagement also comes at a time when india is trying to find its place in the msp which is mineral security partnership and what is this partnership this partnership is an ambitious new leaded by us 11 members partnership and why exactly is this partnership what it is meant to be what is exactly this aim of msp is it aims to secure supply chains of critical minerals aimed at reducing dependency on china so obviously it's a us led so it will be to counter china to reduce dependency on china on critical minerals india's exclusion from msp is also seen as a exception in the otherwise upbeat spirit of cooperation with washington dc so india always wants the uh, cooperation to be well and smooth with washington dc but this is an exception this exclusion from this msp is an exclusion ipef is the latest plank after the quads strategic focus so this is the latest you can say a uh, mode by us and it's a new economic grouping alongside israel uae us and i2u2 that focuses on cooperation in health water transportation food security space and energy on the other hand new delhi is trying to uh, make the free trade agreement with uk and expected to conclude over the next few weeks and talks with canada are also progressing well this comes on the back of two trade agreements india has done its two trade agreement free trade agreements with uae australia they have been signed over the last 12 months india is also hopeful of concluding the negotiations for two more such pacts by the end of 2022 this was quoted by unions commons and industry minister piyush goel even as india charts its own unique course trade deficit continued to remain high in august you see a trade deficit 27 billion dollar although it has reduced from 30 billion but it's, it's still high there are three broad concerns that are going into christmas season what are the three broad concerns first european union it's a key market and i've already told you that it's going into a sharp recession and why exactly is the growth of european union not going to be high because of energy shock europe is exactly a lot dependent on russia and what russia is doing it has reduced the export of energy because of the economic sanctions that europe has supported with west second is apart from broader downturn in the global economy that have impacted the shipments global buyers of good from countries such as india they are seeing difference in shipment of confirmed order for christmas so whatever so this exactly means that india have indian people have ordered some shipments from foreign but they have seen postponed dates of such shipment in the us india is the single biggest mar- uh, us india's single biggest mar- uh, market the inflationary pressure is reducing the customer demand and big box retailer are cutting back on inventories last one is the increasing negative list for exports that now ex- include wheat steel and iron pellets so these negative list have also impacted the outbound shipments 
and some varieties of rice also has been just added to the list. All of this adds to the worsening balance of trade situation. So the trade is going in a worse balance because of this addition of rice. So this is, uh, I think, not important that India current account deficit could rise to. This is a uh, forecast by some members. Uh, we see as buyers move away from China, both as the country is becoming costlier and also less reliable with a zero COVID tolerance policy. Because Indian buyers are moving away from China, so they have to find new areas in order to purchase goods. Also anti-India sentiments are also anti-China sentiments are also gaining ground. There is a positive for India in the medium to long term. So India will find another grounds for its purchase and world can find India as a new hub for imports. So this is what exactly this means. It was a little complicated article, but uh, I would say that this was very important and IPEF is what exactly is being discussed here. We will see in the future that whether free trade agreements with uh, UK keeps its pace or not. Now coming this is a uh, city page. This is also the city page, not much news is given here. This is government and politics page. Then comes the explained page. So here we see a big headline, Supreme Court to take CAA challenge. Where does the case stand? So we have witnessed the CAA in 2019. A lot of conflict have occurred. Now the case uh, is in the hands of Supreme Court. What exactly is the status of this CAA? We will discuss here. A three judge bench of the Supreme Court that is led by our new Chief or Chief Justice of India, Mr. UU Lalit, will hear the challenge to the CAA on Monday. What exactly is this act and what is the legal challenge that follows it? So, this Citizen, uh, Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 it is seeking to grant citizenship to a class of migrants. So the people coming from foreign areas, it wants to grant citizenship to those people and these belongs to religions such as Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, Parsi or Christian communities from Afghanistan, Bangladesh or Pakistan. Act was passed 2019, notified 2020. Government claimed that amendment was sympathetic and was inclusionary. Critics say that it was unconstitutional and anti-Muslim. So if you cannot find Muslim here written, so this is what exactly is the conflict. Critics call it unconstitutional, anti-Muslim. Law provoked widespread protest in the country. This law was an amendment to the Citizenship Act 1955. It was challenged before the Supreme Court. Under what? Under Article 32 of the Constitution who is the lead petitioner, Indian Union Muslim League, IUML. Other petitioners include politicians, OSC, Jairam Ramesh, Ramesh Chenithala, Mahua Motra, and political parties, also groups, such as Assam Pradesh Congress Committee, Travid Munetra Kazkam, Assom Gan Parishad. So this challenge rests primarily on what? This challenge is primarily on the grounds that this law, this amendment violates Article 14 of the Constitution. And what does Article 14 guarantees? It guarantees that no person shall be denied the right to equality before the law or the equal protection of law in the territory of India. So this article is titled as Equality Before Law. It is challenged under this article. Supreme Court has developed a two-pronged test to examine a law on grounds of Article 14. Two tests have been drawn in order, to, in order to examine this. First, is any differentiation between groups of persons must be found on intelligible differentia. 
So what exactly that means? It means that you cannot just differentiate one person to another person on any ground. It must be based on some reasoning, some logic. And second, this differentia must be rational nexus to object that sought to be achieved by the act. That means the difference that you are making must have a rational relation, must have a logical relation to the object, to the aim that you want to achieve by this act. Simply put, if you say that for law to satisfy the conditions under Article 14, for any law that wants to satisfy the condition under Article 14, it has to create a reasonable class of subjects that it seeks to, cover, uh, seeks to govern under the law. So even if the classification is reasonable, any person who falls in that category has to be treated alike. So you have to find a reasonable class. And those challenging the law have argued that if protecting persecuted minor minorities is ostensibly the objective of law, then why, why exactly there is exclusion of some countries? For example, Muslims from Pakistan. And why exactly it is using religion as a yardstick that may fall foul of the test? This is what uh, is a real challenge before the law. For the granting citizenship on the ground of religion is seen to be against the secular nature of constitution. You know, the basic structure has that part, secular. You see that in preamble too. And it cannot be altered by parliament. So in the CAA challenge, petitioners have asked the court to look into whether the special treatment that has been given to the persecuted minorities from the three Muslim majority neighboring countries only is a reasonable classification under 14 article for granting citizenship and whether the state is discriminating against Muslim by excluding them. So you know Bangladesh, Pakistan and the third country name which is Afghanistan, predominantly Muslim majority countries. And they're talking that the state India, which is discriminating against Muslim by excluding them. It is not reasonable under Article 14. What exactly is the status of the case? Challenge has only one substantive hearing since 2020. 2021, Government of India issued an order and it was issued an order under 16 section of the Citizenship Act, giving district collectors in 13 districts with a high migrant population the power to accept citizenship applications from the group identified in the 2019 amendment. So this is clear. This IUML, which is a lead petitioner, it filed an application and requested a stay on this order, after which our union government have filed a response. Since then, the case has not been heard and we see it exactly in the hand of Supreme Court. What exactly is the government's stand? What, how do they defend themselves? The Home Ministry have told Supreme Court in an affidavit that it has no relation with the CAA Act 2019. Government also cited instances of such delegation of power in the past. It also gave examples of past. Said that 2016, government used section 16 and delegated its powers to grant citizenship by registration or also naturalization to collectors of 16 district and also home secretaries of government of seven state in respect to migrant that belong to six specified minority communities of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So he's talking for exactly this means that the person who uh, wants to come from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh, they can get the citizenship of India by registration or naturalization in some areas for a period of two years. And it said that it was done to the fast track the decision or citizenship applicants of this category of for, uh, foreigners. So this was done in 2016. What exactly in 2018? This delegation of power was extended. Government argued that notification, this notification does not provide for any relaxation to foreigners. 
and applies only to foreigners who have entered the country legally so only those people who have entered the country legally can get their citizenship by registration or naturalization not illegal person and also post that challenge to notification and said that it is inconceivable that such applications can be filed in original writ petitions against this CAA what exactly is the future what happens next this listing of CAA challenge indicates that hearing will be fast-tracked court will have to ensure that all the pleadings all the written submissions these are filed and they are served to the opposite party before it is listed for final hearing also some petitioners can seek a referral and what is the referral what exactly they will seek they will seek to a larger constitutional bench but the challenge is to a statute and it does not directly involve interpretation of constitution so because it is an act it is not an amendment of some article it is the act that has been amended so this challenge is to the statute not just not directly the interpretation of constitution these issues are also likely to be debated before the court and it will allot time for final hearing so in the future we will see exactly what is the take of government and how exactly they defend this take on the CAA Act now next come the explained page which is uh, explained about economy the curbs on India's rice export so what is exactly in the news why is the news because the government has banned the export of rice and this is not basmati rice this is the rice that is broken it is mainly used for cattle food so the possibility of a fall in rice production due to deficit and deficient rainfall and fears of depletion of stocks in case of sub par kharif harvest have led to the restrictions but the impact on exporters is unlikely to be huge what exactly is being done the rain modi government four months ago it they have banned exports of wheat and now following an unexpected crop failure and because of low public stocks there are similar concerns that are arising that have led the government to impose curbs to so not an outright ban on rice shipments as well what exactly are the restrictions there are four categories of rice exports out of these exports in the case of two which is basmati and par boiled non basmati rice they are allowed no touch to them curves are only for two kinds other two kinds which is raw white and broken non basmati rice on thursday the department of revenue in the ministry of finance import notified that imposition of a 20% duty on exports of rice that are other than parboiled and basmati rice will be in effect from september 9 this would have covered all raw non basmati rice shipment so all of them whether full or broken grains but on the same night other uh, notification came and it imposed a blanket ban on the broken rice exports thus we see that even within a raw non basmati the only exports of full grain would be permitted on payment of 20% export duty so for the white rice you have to pay 20% export duty and broken rice exports are banned how this will impact the country's overall rice export india 2022 shipped 21.21 million tons of rice cost 9.66 billion it included 3.95 metric ton of basmati rice cost 3.54 billion and 17 metric ton non basmati which costed 6.12 billion so this is i think data which is not that important simply put the curbs announced will affect just under half of india's rice export 
in terms of quantity and over a third by value. Why these distinctions have been placed? Two basic reasons. First, monsoon uh, deficient rainfall in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Gangetic, West Bengal. And second reason has to do with stocks. So first reason also contains some dwarfing of paddy plants in Punjab and Haryana because of a new virus. So there was a news regarding this uh, virus also. Second reason has to do with the stocks. Public wheat stocks on August 1 are 26.65 metric ton, lowest in 14 years. So public stocks are very low and also there is a political pressure to continue the free food grain schemes such as Pradhan Mantri, Galib, Kalyan, Anna Yojana. So with very little wheat, there is very little wheat in the go downs. Rice is the one that can sustain the public distribution system and that is the reason why it has curbed ban and also restrictions on the import. How important is India to the global rice trade? World's largest exporter with share of 40%, 21 metric ton plus shipments last year way ahead of the countries such as Thailand, Vietnam, Pakistan. So India matters a lot in the global trade in rice, unlike in wheat, where Russia and Ukraine are at the top. So wheat, in wheat, India is occasionally a large exporter. So even in 21-22, 2021-22, export touched an all-time high of 7.23 million. Wheat shipments hardly 5% contribution by India. So India's wheat export ban made a larger, uh, largely news on account of timing in the midst of war in Ukraine. Where does India export rice? Uh, more than 75% Basmati exports to Iran, Arabian Peninsula countries, US, UK, Canada, Australia also add up 10%. Non Basmati goes 55% to African countries and also include Benin, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Togo, Guinea, Madagascar, Cameroon, Djibouti, Somalia, Liberia. 9.5% also accounted to top two individual buyers. First is the China and Bangladesh. Then second is Benin and Nepal. 8 to 9% each they exported from India. Much of the exports to Africa and Bangladesh, so exports of Africa and Bangladesh consist of parboiled rice. China import mostly the broken rice. So this is exactly the rice that have been banned. What exactly are the parboiled and broken rice? So rice is derived from milling of paddy grains, you know that. Paddy has at least 20 to 20 percent of husk that is inedible covering that is removed and 10 to 11 percent bran which is you may have seen the brown outer, uh, outer layer which is also removed. So after removal of this uh, brown thing the white rice only uh, constitute about 68 to 69 percent of patty and also the mill rice has both whole and broken rice. Parboiling, this is the process in which paddy is soaked in water. It is, it is steamed and then dried while retaining its outer husk. So what exactly it helps? It results in rice becoming harder. So what is the process? First you soak the water rice, uh, rice in water then steam it and then dry it with its outer husk. Result, more hard rice with less breakage on milling. So this part boiled rice exports from India, it contains at least 5 to 15 percent of broken grains. So this is again, uh, you see some data. Finally, will India's rice export take a massive hit now? Not really. 
and who say that Vijay Sethia who is a former president of All India Rice Exporter Association. He said that wise, uh, white rice that consists of 5% broken is currently being shipped out of India to Pakistan, Vietnam, Thailand. No, it is shipped at about 340 tons, 340 dollar per tons. And Pakistan, Vietnam and Thailand are ahead of it. A 20% tax isn't going to uh, render India's rice uncompetitive because already there are other major players that represent Pakistan, Vietnam, Thailand. Moreover, it is well known that not two small portions of India's rice exports are from leaked PTS grain. The ban on shipments that exactly is the broken rice it is an inferior grain. It is not used in cooking, not for human use. It is used mainly for animal feed and also to make ethanol from such rice. So it may be a part of larger crackdown. And you know the major uh, importer of such rice is China. So that is exactly why India does not care. So we see that. And this was uh, the whole, I would say, uh, reason of such a backlash to rice. Now comes the word news. So we see Ukraine push for more Russian held areas. So we have seen this in first page that Ukraine wants to reaccess its own land that was uh, invaded by Russia. And not, uh, not much news is given here in the word page. Next come the economy page. So this uh, was uh, from China, uh, not that important. This is a private sector news. So in today's economy page there was not such news. It is a news FBI includes uh, close to 5.6k but it's a monthly news not that important we are more focused on uh, yearly basis analysis of economy so this was a newspaper and uh, if you find some more news you can read it as well and also you can find uh, editorial pages on TNA they are also given I will put down link in description